so today I'm presenting this case study from this region together with Dominique Alios, who couldn't be here, who is a um, uh, senior lecturer at the University of uh, Rennes uh, in France. So uh, the idea of this uh, project comes from very far away. So we started in 2008 uh, as a group of young researchers and students from various universities to work together in this site in the Puy de Dome, the district of um, Mourol and saint Nectaire, that are two very, very nice villages, um, very known for cheese, for example. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we started this project with a lot of people with different interests uh, as a sort of joint venture, uh, both from a scientific and a personal point of view. Um, and we ended up like creating a sort of multidisciplinary, more interdisciplinary environment. And I want to talk to you about uh, what concerns the stones and specifically the, the building materials um, and the evolution of the use of um, building materials over time in this uh, area, because in a way it's a bit the core of this interdisciplinarity, where all like the different kind of data like arrive at the end, and database that we could like build um, over time. So, um, why the stones, and why are we trying to um, tell stories about stone materials in this area? Because of course, like as I often say, like the. Uh, story of humans is in a way carved in stones. Uh, it's something that uh, takes and keeps the traces of um, human uh, interactions and relationships. So uh, in a way, what we often do, and Cathy was evoking as well, is try to provenance in the stones as materials themselves. So we try to link raw materials and sources. We try to link objects and where they come from, which is what we normally call uh, provenance or provenience studies, which is like a bit different, but I'm not going to go into the details, um, and which is what often happens when we try to study like objects um, in a certain moment of time, a bit frozen um, in history. But uh, I would say that uh, more than trying to link in like, sources with uh, sites, we should try to create a narrative of these stones, in the sense that uh, we should try to reconstruct the different steps of movements that these stones, like these materials took, like from the quarrying moment, or in the core itself, like as geological processes, to the place where they are when we are looking at them. And yet their stories is not over, because they will continue to be looked at, um, and they will continue to have like agencies uh, that will just change over time. Um, and in doing this, I normally use the concept of biography, uh, the cultural biography of objects, as it is um, uh, theorized by Kopitov, it was theorized by Kopitov in '86. So the idea that things, as humans, can have biographies, and we can actually trace their movement and the the, the things that happened to them. Um, and how do we do this? This is a bit tricky, right? Because if we want to create something more complex than a link from the source to another place, then we have to find tools and techniques to trace these movements. Um, and what I try to do like in my PhD in, is that I would like to trace this movement starting from the physical materiality of the object. So try to describe which kind of traces and which kind of alteration they have. Um, and how they got these marks and what these marks means, uh, and trying to connect these like physical material properties to the stories that we can tell, uh, starting uh, from this. So uh, over time, we've experimented all um, all bunch of palette of tools to map these materialities, um, and I don't want to like. Uh, go into details too much, but uh, we try to overlap different systems from uh, spectroscopy to hyperspectral imaging, uh, analysis of the mortar, so petrography, uh, thin sections, and then like more traditional surveys and GIS database together with photogrammetry and all sorts of things to see actually which kind of tools can give us um, the data that we need to create uh, these kind of narratives. Um, 
But let's go to the stones, which are the object of uh, our, our session. So um, this is a very poor quality geological map, but that's all we have. So as I was saying before, this region is a volcanic region. It's a quite young uh, volcanic region, Auvergne. Um, like in the Puy de Dome, the last eruptions date to uh, almost like 6,000 year BC. So it's very, very young. Um, which makes that a lot of eruption covered up already like some archaeological deposits. So we are waiting for some kind of prehistoric Pompeii, but yeah. Um, so the thing is, like, it's so complicated, the geology of this area, that we actually don't have a more detailed geological map. So this is what we have, and we have to deal with this um, and uh, try to um, mine the gap with a lot of survey. Uh, so we work with geologists and we do a lot, a lot of field work, which is awesome because we can actually see these things on, in place and um, make up our mind and we can have an intuition of the data we are working with as well. Uh, but yeah, the institute, the BRGM, is uh, working on the new uh, geological map that we'll publish very, very soon, I hope. So uh, what kind of stones do we have? Of course, like probably most of you are familiar with volcanic environment, uh, but there is a whole range of outcrops and all range of stones with very, very different uh, physical properties. Uh, going from basalt, for example, which is the hardest one. Uh, basalt is very hard to cut. It's almost impossible to cut. So normally it's uh, split along the natural joints. Um, it's an extrusive rock, it's basically issued by the cooling lava coming out from the volcano. Um, so what happens with basalt that is that it's normally quarried locally. Uh, it's very difficult to cut, so we would just like grab a block of stones and build something nearby. It's not transport, usu transported usually. Uh, it doesn't travel a lot. And a wonderful example of the use of basalt is this castle, the castle of Mural, which is literally built in basalt and on basalt because it's um, on a plate of basalt that is like gliding on a hill of clay. And you can see it here and here, you have, I don't know if you can see it, you have like small parts of the natural rock, the natural outcrop um, coming out and actually the castle, it uses the rock, natural rock, as embankment, and it's like kind of covered with like the masonry, and it makes the castle looking bigger. <laughs> so actually, they use the natural rock to look like bigger and nastier. Um, and it's completely black, of course, because this rock is very dark. And fun fact is that they uh, completely painted, the castle was completely painted in, in white. Uh, so that it could stick out uh, in this area. Uh, another rock, um, type of rock, another type of lava, types of lavas, are trachyte and trachybasalt, um, like changing on the type of minerals, uh, according to the type of minerals they have in, but they are more soft rocks that can actually be worked and are used for sculptures and um, more uh, monumental buildings, like not that the castle is not, but uh, like this church um, built in the um, 11th century, the Church of San Nectar. This is a head of columns like in the church. Uh, and this is an equestrian Roman statue. The photo is really bad, but it's the only one we got. Um, and all these things are, are uh, sculpted, or the, the, the stones, sorry, are quarried from these outcrops. And we have various types of quarries of this stone that is very like um, nice and to work. Uh, from open pits to like erratic blocks that are just quarried as they are. Um, and then we have the pyroclastic rocks, as scoria, for example. And these rocks are very different because they're very soft, very easy to cut, but at the same time, not very resistant. And we have different kind of uh, features um, carved in this type of rock. For example, these like carved uh, settlements in the Middle Age, around the 8th century, there is a systematic um, operation of carving of these outcrops. Wherever there is pyroclastic rock, there is a cave. Uh, and there are cliff castles pretty much everywhere. And the material that is carved out from this um, case, it's used locally. So for example, uh, the village that is just down, um, like close to this case, is completely built with the rocks taken 
uh, from the excavation. So you have like the castle in the cliff and the village down. And uh, last but not least, the limestone, because the limestone, of course, like in a volcanic environment, the sedimentary is very, very, very difficult to find. So uh, all these monuments, of course, need mortar. And in order to get mortar, you need limestone. So people would go. We found on the, in, the, in the text, in the written sources, that in the 15th century, they would go all the way to Clemenza from here to get the limestone, which is like um, something like eight kilometers, which is quite a lot. Uh, so we decided to put all this information in a database, in a GIS environment, of course. We try to use QGIS because we want to be open, uh, but it's quite tricky when it comes to database. Um, so we try to use, of course, like the cell, the core of our database is the sites, and then to this we uh, connect all the other like uh, research access that we have. Um, and mine, in particular, is bounded to the part um, talking about the geology of geomorphology of the sites, and of course we added something about the building materials because this is fundamental to try to see the network. And in the building materials, we try to specify the chronology, a description of the stone masonry, the type of material, the size of the block, the tools used, which kind of technique were used and some analytical data if we have, and we're trying to connect uh, the analytical part. Uh, so um, this is connected to the typology, the thesaurus about the typology of the sites includes quarries. So we can also identify the quarry sites, and then we try to link in this way the building material to the quarries. And these passing by uh, the road network uh, that is just overlapped for the moment, or we try to link it with some kind of uh, network analysis. So what happens is that we have a mess. <laughs> we have loads of sites, loads of roads. Uh, you can, uh, the, I'm sorry, the legends are um, in French because the base is in French. But you can see these small squares are the quarries, and we have like quarrying sites pretty much everywhere, and then a lot of different sites. Uh, built where we can identify materials. So from these like massive amount of data, we are trying to get out some short stories. Um, and then that's the case, for example, of the prehistoric materials. We have a lot of menhir and dolmens that are usually like uh, made in stones that could fa be found nearby. Um, so like volcanic rocks, but for example, all the tools that have been collected by villagers in time are made of uh, often made of other type of stones that are coming from abroad. And that's also the reason why the villagers picked up like this stone axis, because they were different from the type of rocks that they could see. Uh, so we have like for that tiny one is Chedid coming from Alps. <laughs> um, so that's um, one interesting thing. And that's for the antiquity, the things change radically because you have like few built sites built on local stones, but we have an interesting phenomenon that is the rise of the first uh, systematic quarrying sites, which is the site of Farsh that we have identified with like a lot, uh, a bunch of ancient quarries on the top of a hill, a vicus, a village for quarrymen just close by. Um, and then we have, of course, a modern quarry down here. Um, here there is like a um, carved settlement, because this is like a pyroclastic um, rock. Uh, and this is the plan of the caves. And then there is probably another digest down here. So it's the first like really organized uh, system. And it starts from the second century. Uh, and then, of course, like in the Middle Age, uh, things change radically again, because we have a lot of um, built site with a lot of um, quarries and the relationship between built site and quarries shows that uh, in the Middle Age they had a very precise uh, knowledge of uh, their, the geology of the environment and they would pick a very specific type of rock, the closest one, the easier one to quarry and the perfect one for their need. Uh, so yeah, for example here I highlighted like the quarries used for the church and the castle and they are all um, nearby. So, yeah, in conclusion, because I'm running out of time, I'm already um, more than 15 minutes, but uh, in conclusion, <laughs> um, I have a problem, and it's also like a question that I would like to um, throw there for the discussion, which is like, uh, we should probably talk more about scales. Uh, scales of 
time and movement when we talk about rocks, because of course, like, uh, when we talk about durability of the materials and the fact that they make bridges between humans and something else, humans and the god, humans and their past, we are also talking about different scales of uh, durability of things, because humans have another scale of durability than rocks. And of course, like these materials that are like apparently unchanged make create bridges with other worlds. But it's not, I mean, stones are not unchanged, are not still. We know that they change as well. They just change at another rate. So um, we should try to understand this and probably discuss it um, because I think it could be a very interesting point, like a uh, very interesting knot for uh, our stone studies. Um, and also like the scales of the stories we can tell. Because of course we can go from a very big pictures to the very detailed um, storytelling. And how do we choose which stories we want to tell and how we decide um, how far the stone can go in a sense. Um, and that's it. <laughs> so.